We've talked about it before uh, in 2008, uh, in Georgia in 2015, uh, in Syria, 2014, in Ukraine, Crimea. Uh, Vladimir Putin's always uh, made very calculated moves. He's gained much uh, and paid very small price. The opposite's taking place here. Uh, and at this point, he's saber rattling, talking about nuclear weapons. I'm curious, uh, what's your read on the situation? And now that the inverse is true, where he's gaining very little uh, at a great geopolitical price, uh, what's his next move? Well, Joe, before I get to that, I just want to say, isn't it great we have Ambassador Brzezinski in Poland right now? That I know Mark, I've known him for a long time. He knows what right and wrong is and good and evil. It is fantastic he is in Poland right now. I know Polish people and Ukrainian people are very enthusiastic that he's on the job right now. So thank you, U.S. Senate, for finally getting your job done. Joe, on your question, thank you. I think it's really, really important. Uh, remember, he has been on a run. I need to add Chechnya to your list. Chechnya, 1999. Mm. He's won all these wars. Uh, he's been around for two decades, right? So he's won these wars. He thinks he's on a roll. And he's, in my view, he's obviously o overreached here, right? And by the way, this is a pattern we see around the world. This is not something unique to Russia or even the Soviet Union. When dictators hold on for too long, they overreach. They get disconnected from reality. They don't listen to their advisors. That's exactly what's going on here. Uh, I was just conversing yesterday with, with, with people in Russia, some one in particular that knows Russian elites well, has known Vladimir Putin for 30 years, and they are appalled at how disconnected Putin seems from rea reality right now. But that's also scary, too, especially when he starts to talk about nuclear weapons. Yeah, it, it is frightening, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, I, I know... Uh, that uh, we are looking uh, through a glass darkly and can't really see what's happening on the other side. A lot of Americans, a lot of people across the West wondering uh, what, uh, what happens when enough oligarchs are, are angered, enough insiders are deeply disturbed. Uh, we're hearing reports repeatedly that the uh, Russian, uh, middle-class uh, mm -hmm. Russians are scared and horrified by what's going on here. Um, we used to be able to talk about the Politburo and try to make our best guess about uh, the machinations inside of the Politburo. Uh, what, give, us, give us your best guess about what happens inside. Is there any check to Vladimir Putin? And at what point, when the pain becomes tough enough for oligarchs, for the Russian middle class, for the Russian military, at what point do they move on him? Uh, and try to get him to stop this war or remove him from power? It's the number one question. I, I, obviously, I don't have a clear answer, but I can tell you that in the last, you know, seven days, because I talk to Russians every single day, I talk to Ukrainians every single day, which is corresponding with one, uh, you know, right before we got on here, who, who's close to Mr. Zelensky about just how they are standing firm and the fact that he's standing firm, Zelensky's not leaving Kiev, is driving Putin nuts. Because the whole world is talking about his heroism, and the whole world is talking about how evil Vladimir Putin is. But to your question, Joe, he doesn't have people around him that he listens to. Uh, he's been isolated mm -hmm. forever. He was isolated when I was ambassador eight years ago. He would not listen to anybody. He sat out at his compound outside of town, rarely came to work, does not have a feel for his own country. And that was all okay, as long as everybody's making money, sending their kids abroad, uh, you know, cracking down on the opposition. Everybody was fine. But now it's that that elite that that the elite that has benefited from Putin's regime that has now turned on him, uh, because they never thought that he was going to do this. Right? They never thought he would be so crazy as to do this kind of attack. And they are all in shock. By the way, not without reason, a lot of Ukrainians, a lot of Americans didn't think he would uh, he'd do this. And so they that is happening now. But the problem is they do not have mechanisms to turn their their discontent into stopping him. But I can tell you there, there are people now, you know, just discussing that talk about for the first time ever since Putin's been in power for 22 years, that maybe we need, you know, hopefully there'll be a coup 
hopefully they'll stop him before it's too late. I'm not predicting that. I want to be crystal clear about that. If it, I think that's a very low probability event. Um, but the fact that it's being discussed, that is something new. He is, he's lost this country, including the people that are closest to him. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, we've learned uh, through the years to be very skeptical of news reports uh, that come out of the fog of war, predictions on how one side's doing, how another side's doing. It, it would seem to be particularly difficult in this case. Uh, but did we not get uh, a better understanding of just how badly things were going for Russian troops when Vladimir Putin started talking about uh, nuclear uh, preparedness yesterday morning? Exactly. Exactly. He's not saying that if he's winning the war, right? I've seen him when he's winning wars. He's a very snug guy. Uh, uh, you know, he sits with his legs all spread out. And he, you know, you know, you know how he talks, right? Uh, you're not seeing that in Putin right now. You would not be. He would not be saying those things if the war wasn't going badly. The 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 the, the other part of that, however, is that he's moving on. I think to uh, Plan B right now. He thought shock and awe. He was going to attack cities. Uh, the Ukrainians were going to fold. Zelensky was going to run to Poland, and he, he would put some, you know, uh, puppet in. That's not happening. And what I fear happening, especially watching things on the ground in Kharkiv, is he's moved to an old Russian, his old strategy that he's used in cities like Aleppo, uh, throughout Chechnya, which is much more civilian casualties um, to try to uh, turn things around. Hearing from people from Kharkiv, you know, just eight hours ago, they said they're going to fight to the end. Uh, but, but I think he's pivoted to that. And the other thing I want to say, Joe, part of the reason it's gone so bad is he's misjudged his own military. I just listened to, I don't know, four dozen interviews with Russians last night who were captured in, in, in Ukraine. And they're asked, you know, why are you fighting? They can't answer that question. Uh, the Ukrainians put them on with their moms, right, on the phone, and they say, tell your mom, why are you here? Why are you here? And they say, I don't know. Why? And I think we've underestimated, well, Putin, I think, has underestimated that. I think maybe the world has, right? It's one thing to have capabilities, but you have to have the will to fight. And that 58-minute rambling speech that Putin gave, I, I probably was the only one that listened to the end, right? Because <laughs> I don't think many Russians did. He could not explain what this war is about, and I think that affects the morale of the, the Russians that he sent into Ukraine, and that he's calling on the Belarusians to help him out. That's another sign of desperation. That's another sign this war is not going according to plan. Well, and, and finally, Mr. Ambassador, let's give perspective to our viewers. You and I grew up in a Cold War uh, from my earliest days. Uh, I, I heard uh, about how the, the communists, the Soviets were bad. Uh, we, we were, uh, not, not to become a caricature of myself and, and Americans uh, in the South, but we wore uh, Apollo tie tacks to Sunday school and church and fighter jets. My dad worked for Lockheed, uh, but we weren't alone. Uh, we, we, from an early, early age, uh, we were cold warriors, and uh, most Americans grew up that way. So, too, did Russians. That's just not the case with these, these for the most part, these kids— that are going into Ukraine fighting a war that they do not understand. This is not uh, the twilight struggle uh, that, that uh, previous generations would have thought if they were inside Soviet tanks going into Ukraine. It's a great point. Um, and, and if you look at the kids that are demonstrating, and I, you know, we'll see them, the, the brave people in Russia demonstrating, they're of a different generation, too. They're just so much younger. There they are. Look at those faces, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they look like my kids. Mm -hmm. They're not my generation. But there's one negative thing about your saying, what you're saying. Vladimir Putin grew up in the Cold War. Vladimir Putin is fighting against us in Ukraine. He is framing this war about us uh, and, tragically, uh, that's the mindset that, that has brought him to this war. He thinks he's still fighting that old war. And the older generations in Russia does, too. So we've got to be careful about public opinion polls and overreading them. There's no incentive for people to actually tell you what they think. Uh, and the ones that do tend to be much older, more rural. Uh, they're the ones listening to the propaganda stations. Uh, but these folks that you're showing right now, they are not.
And All right. the shock to the Russian economic system will only add to this. Hey, thanks so much for watching our YouTube channel. You can follow up on today's top stories and breaking news or catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.